Good morning. This is Jason Bowman from Prolera.com, and welcome to this presentation on partial pay installment agreements. Before we get started, a couple reminders. In order to receive continuing education credit for today's webinar, uh, you must stay logged in for the full hour. Uh, you must answer all three polling questions. Uh, that applies to you enrolled agents also. Um, please answer the polling questions. Uh, and if you meet both of those criteria, we'll send you your certificate of completion within 72 hours. Uh, if you are an EA, the uh, reporting to the IRS uh, will take place most likely in October uh, because of the fact that the IRS is transitioning to a new um, uh, CE system vendor right now. So there will be a lockout on the system next week, uh, so we won't be able to post hours for, for a while. Uh, don't hesitate to ask questions during the presentation. Uh, use the question uh, uh, panel there in GoToWebinar uh, to ans ask any questions, and I'll try to uh, uh, answer as many of those as possible. So partial pay installment agreements, that is our topic for the day. Our course objectives are to understand the installment agreement process, define the requirements for obtaining pending IA status, uh, what that means to you, why you want it. We'll delve into the requirements for a partial pay installment agreement, and we'll talk about the uh, often misunderstood conditions for a CSED extension under a partial pay installment agreement, uh, CSED collection statute expiration date. That is the end of the 10-year statute of limitations during which the IRS has to collect the debt. There are certain conditions, uh, very limited conditions under which that time can be extended for a partial pay installment agreement. So we'll talk about that. So uh, I approach everything from a very methodical, checklist-based process type system. Uh, the, the reason for this is because by having uh, checklists and systems in place, uh, you make sure you don't miss things, you make sure everything runs like clockwork. Um, if, if you have written checklists in place and, and you um, make a mistake on something or discover a new trick, then you can insert it into the checklist and you make sure that everything gets done uh, correctly and, and uh, efficiently all the time. So uh, this is kind of the skeleton of my process for um, uh, working uh, collections cases when I was an enrolled agent, uh, starting with uh, uh, client intake, uh, uh, the investigation of liability, that's the, the pulling of transcripts, doing research on, on IRS accounts. Uh, obviously, you got to do a financial review. Uh, and then those two things together determine the resolution options. And I have that highlighted in green here because that is where we are in this cycle. Uh, so uh, collections casework is a cycle. It's a process. Uh, so here we are jumping from the resolution options, that part of our process, and going down different pathways. Uh, and this is how I tend to look at, um, you know, from a really big picture, 35,000 foot kind of level, how I look at uh, determining what my client is eligible for. So, uh, and we are at the uh, installment agreement phase. Now, obviously, with the partial pay installment agreement, the, the entire thing with the partial pay installment agreement is that the tax liability will never actually get paid in full before the expiration of the statute of limitations on collection. So that's why there are some special considerations, and that's why we're here today. So uh, if you are new to collections representation, uh, colloquially, colloqui, colloquially, whatever that word is, referred to as tax resolution. Um, this is why you should care about installment agreements more than any other resolution pathway. 
Um, it, you know, I, I've been teaching these webinars and, and live seminars for, for what, three or four years now. And inevitably, uh, somebody will come up to me at a, at, a, at a seminar or something like that, and they'll want to know why I didn't talk about offers and compromise. Because they came to the event thinking that tax resolution was all about offers and compromise. Uh, and it's not. Tax resolution, if you really want to boil it down to two primary things, it's about financial analysis and installment agreements. That's really what tax resolution, in the vast majority of cases, really boils down to. So um, if you were only going to ever read two sections of the Internal Revenue Manual, uh, which is uh, part five of the IRM, I would read the Financial Analysis Handbook and the entire section on installment agreements. Um, if you thoroughly understand those two sections of the IRM, you will literally be light years ahead of like 90% of your colleagues when it comes to this stuff. Okay. So this is why you should care about installment agreements. In fiscal year 2015, 0.37% of all IRS collections cases that were closed out were resolved through an offer and compromise. Less than half a percent. Okay? Uh, approximately 15% of tax debtors will be in currently not collectible status. Uh, there are about 2 million Americans in CNC right now. Uh, roughly 5 to 10% of cases uh, that you work on once you're working a large volume of these tax debt cases, about 5 to 10% of them uh, will involve either a full pay uh, or disposition or financing of an asset. Uh, that's where you get into lien work, subordinations, discharges, that sort of thing. But uh, everybody else is going to be on a payment plan. Uh, three quarters uh, or better of the people that you represent in a tax debt collections case will end up on an installment agreement. Uh, the vast majority of those are going to be guaranteed or streamlined. So uh, the regular installment agreements, the in-business trust fund installment agreements, etc., those are, are definitely the minority. Um, but the partial pay installment agreement is important because it is a tool that you should have in your Toolbox. Uh, Hutch had a question. Can we get copies of the slides? Uh, yes, there is a handouts tab in the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, that is where the PDF of the slides is living. So you can download it from there. So uh, now that you know why you should care, let us do our first polling question. And remember, even if you're an enrolled agent, you still need to answer the polling questions to receive credit. Um, however, there is no requirement anywhere that the polling questions actually have anything to do with the topic we're talking about. So, how much wood would a wood chuck chuck if a wood chuck could chuck wood? That is our first polling question. And believe it or not, there actually is a, a correct answer to this question. <laughs> uh, I had to do some research, but. Uh, uh, a, uh, a biologist actually provided an answer to this question uh, about a decade ago. So again, be sure to get your vote in so that you can qualify for credit. I'm only going to leave the, each question up for one minute. So you've got about 10 seconds left. How much wood could a wood chuck chuck if a wood chuck could chuck wood? All right, closing out the poll. And just for the record, the answer is 700 pounds. Um, so there you go. All right, installment agreement benefits. Why would we want to put a client into an IA? First of all, and this is probably the most important one of the bunch, is that enforced collections activities stop both while an IA request is pending and after an installment ag agreement is put into place. So that means wage garnishments, bank account levies, accounts receivable levies, etc. That harassment, that 
and force collection activity goes away. Uh, as soon as you get into pending status, and it stays for as long as the installment agreement is in place. Now, if your client blows up the installment agreement, then all bets are off, and they're back into enforced collections. So uh, that is the single biggest benefit of an IA. Uh, also, there is the potential for lien removal under certain conditions. Uh, that is an entire hour on its own, beyond the scope, really, of today's presentation. Uh, but um, uh, particularly in uh, streamlined installment agreement situations with a balance due of less than $25,000, uh, where they are making the payments through a direct debit to the IRS, um, uh, after you get uh, the first couple of payments in, uh, you can request uh, uh, um, withdrawal of the uh, lien uh, pretty much every time and that's gonna go through okay uh, there are other situations where uh, once you've established a good uh, payment track record uh, there are other conditions under which you can get the lien removed um, if it's not a, a direct debit if it's not uh, less than 25,000 etc um, so that is possible um, there's also the potential for penalty reduction. Uh, installment agreements also allow for seasonal variation. Uh, so um, most of my time in practice, uh, I was in Colorado. Um, and in Colorado, Utah, um, Wyoming, you know, a lot of mountain uh, communities have seasonal businesses based on, on the ski season, the tourist season, et cetera. So uh, businesses that have seasonal variations of income uh, or, you know, think about uh, landscapers, building contractors, those kind of folks, they have seasonal variations of income. So being able to adjust the payment amount that a taxpayer makes based on the variability of their income, that is something that you get with the installment agreement. Um, so that can be another benefit. Uh, number six here, potentially may never have to pay the full amount due. And the reason that one's highlighted in green is because that is the one that's directly applicable to the partial pay installment agreement. Um, the, the, the biggest thing about the PPIA in terms of the benefit to the taxpayer is that they won't necessarily have to pay the full amount due and I know that that's automatically going to ask the question in a lot of people's minds of, well, why not just do an offer and compromise? Well, they may not be eligible for an offer and compromise. Remember that an offer and compromise is based purely 100% on a mathematical formula, okay? Uh, and if the, uh, if the offer amount that comes out of that defined, strict, formula is more than the amount that they owe, then they're simply not eligible for the offer and compromise. You know, there's, there's, there's no two ways about it. And so in those situations, you might want to instead be looking at the PPIA. Now, there are some downsides to an installment agreement. Uh, first of all are the user fees. Uh, and keep in mind that, uh, what was it, probably about, uh, I think it was about a month or so ago, uh, the IRS uh, announced the, the 2017 increases uh, to these user fees. So these numbers are going up, okay, um, for most of these. Uh, the, the biggest change, however, is the installment agreements that are set up using the online tool are going to have the lowest fee of all. It's going to be even lower than the low income IA fee. Um, I believe it's going to be 30 something dollars, 31, 32 dollars, somewhere around there, uh, is what it's going to be next year for the online installment agreement uh, uh, fee. Purpose there, obviously, IRS, in order to address the, the the issues with customer service and the telephone hold times, all that stuff. They're trying to push as much stuff to the internet as possible, okay? 
So um, that is why they are making the, the user fee for the online installment agreement tool uh, much lower. Uh, other downsides to an installment agreement, and this is the one that you're going to get the most pushback from clients on, no matter what, um, whether they're uh, uh, in the top 1% or the, the bottom 1% of, of American net worth, um, this is going to be the one you get the, the biggest pushback on, and it is the financial disclosure requirement. Different types of installment agreements have different levels of financial disclosure that are required. Something such as a guaranteed installment agreement uh, for you know, less than $10,000 of personal income tax, that has no financial disclosure requirement. You can set those up online, and there's no financial questions, and just they're, they're automatic. Um, there's partial disclosure. So, for example, uh, most folks are, are used to this in a streamlined situation. Uh, if you ever call ACS and you're setting up a payment plan, you know, on a fifteen, twenty thousand uh, dollar income tax debt for one of your clients, uh, and the ACS rep starts asking you some basic financial questions, um, and in your head you're thinking, "Oh, I didn't think I had to give any of this information." Well, that's a misconception within even our our tax pro community. Uh, the streamlined installment agreement does require. Um, at, at a minimum, a, a basic set of income and expense information. Okay? Then at the complete opposite end of the spectrum, there is the full financial disclosure requirement. Uh, this is what I um, uh, perhaps unhumorously refer to as the full rubber glove treatment. Uh, and this is the exact same level of financial disclosure as is required for an offer in compromise investigation. Okay? It is the exact same process. Um, and a full financial investigation is required for a regular installment agreement and partial pay installment agreements. And again, that's why I have it highlighted here in green. So a lot of your clients don't want to tell the IRS all of their personal financial information. So here is the analogy that I used when I was in practice uh, with, with clients. What I tell them is, is that, okay, you know you owe money to the government, uh-huh, because you didn't pay your taxes, uh-huh. So you essentially took an unauthorized loan from the federal government. And now we have to apply for a loan in arrears. So I tell them, if you've ever applied for a loan, especially a mortgage, remember that process? Yes. Well, it's very similar. And the difference between, say, applying for a credit card versus a mortgage is that a credit card on the application, they just want to know about your, your sources of income, and that's pretty much it. On a mortgage, they're going to verify your assets. They're going to verify, they're going to pull copies of your tax returns to verify your income. All that stuff is going to happen on a mortgage application. So full financial disclosure is like a mortgage application. When I use that analogy, I've never had a, a client not understand. Okay. Uh, another downside, obviously, is the monthly payments. Uh, also, the penalties and interest still accrue. So on any type of installment agreement, guaranteed, streamlined, IBTF, regular, PPIA, no matter what type of installment agreement it is, penalties and interest continue to get tacked on until either the debt is paid in full or the CSED expires. And then we already talked about one of the downsides uh, specific to the PPIA is that the taxpayer might have to keep paying beyond the CSED. This is rare, but it does happen. Uh, let me cover some questions that have come in. Uh, so C said collection statute expiration date. That is the end of the 10 year statute of limitations on the IRS's ability to collect the tax debt. Uh, DDIA direct debit installment agreement. Uh, the IRS discovered that they are more likely to get paid if they set up an auto draft against your bank account 
to collect the monthly installment agreement fee. Um, can we as practitioners set up installment agreements online for our clients? Renee, yes, you can. Um, we can, if you have power of attorney, you can set up an installment agreement online for your client uh, using the public facing tool. Um, let's see. Is it a viable alternative to a formal IA for the taxpayer to make a partial payment of the balance due? Wait for a notice saying you owe money. Send another partial. Um, uh, Lucinda, that's uh, kind of beyond the scope here. Uh, yes, that can be done, uh, but um, it, it would take me the rest of the hour to, to walk through that that process. So I'm sorry, but I'm gonna I'm gonna punt on that question. Uh, the answer to your question is yes, that can be done. Um, uh, but there are other issues there. The biggest thing is that you don't get the protection from levy action if you if you do what you're describing there. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, there are six general types of installments agree installment agreements. Uh, there's the guaranteed installment agreement for uh, 1040 liabilities under ten thousand dollars. There's the streamlined installment agreement uh, for uh, tax debts less than fifty thousand. There's the in business trust fund IA, which is intended only for operating businesses where the business is going to pay. Uh, the trust fund portion of payroll tax. Uh, there's the in-business trust fund regular, which is a, a full-blown installment agreement um, uh, um, that is not uh, um, the, the limited financial disclosure. Uh, anything that is not one of the special types of installment agreement is simply a regular installment agreement. Um, and that's the actual term used in the IRM is regular installment agreement, okay? So, so anything that's not special is regular. Uh, and then there's obviously the PPIA. So uh, pending installment agreements, these are important. Pending IA status is your friend. Um, pending status provides protection. The IRS cannot levy your client while an installment agreement request is pending. So, uh, does it therefore not make sense that as soon as a client hires you and you are able to do a back of the envelope calculation based on their income and expenses, doesn't it make sense to get your installment agreement request in as soon as possible? Yes, it does. So even if you don't have complete 433 information yet, get your IA request in as soon as possible so that you get protection against levies, wage garnishments, etc. You can request an installment agreement by voicemail, fax, email, carrier pigeon, stone tablet, etc. It does not need to use the form 9465. I have never filed a 9465 in my entire career. I did taxpayer representation for eight straight years. I never once filed a 9465. Okay. Fax, certified letter, voicemail, okay, all of those are sufficient, according to the IRM, to get you into pending installment agreement status. Uh, Erica asks, how do you request a, an installment agreement by fax? You send a fax to the revenue officer saying, I request an installment agreement. <laughs> That's all you do. Okay. Uh, in order to uh, be a qualifying request, you have to include specific information. First of all, you have to provide inner information sufficient to identify the taxpayer. This means name and taxpayer ID number. Okay, uh, if those things are not on there, then you're not going to get the pending status. Uh, so, in other words, if you're sending a fax, don't forget to put 
the social or EIN on the, 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 the facts to the, to the revenue officer, okay? You also have to identify the tax liabilities to be covered by the installment agreement. By the way, you'll notice that this is all the same information that's on the Form 9465, okay? But you don't have to use the Form 9465. That, that, that's, the, that's the point. But under the IRM, in order to obtain the pending status, you have to include this information. Um, if you submit an installment agreement request and you forget to leave off, say, you know, two, qu two quarters of, of 941 liabilities um, by accident, guess what? The revenue officer can come back and levy on those two quarters because you failed to put it on the request. You might have pending status protection for every other quarter, but if you forgot to put two quarters on, then your client can still get levied for those quarters. It does happen, okay? So this is why you want to uh, cover your own rear end and double check that you have all quarters included. You also need to include the proposed payment terms. So for example, let's say you're working with a landscaper uh, who has seasonal income. You're, you need to put in the request that installment agreement payment will be $900 a month uh, for, you know, May, June, July, August, September, and then $250 per month for all other months, okay? You need to specify that level of detail in your request. Also, the taxpayer must be compliant with filing requirements. This is non-negotiable. If there are outstanding tax returns, you're not going to get pending status, and you cannot get an installment agreement. All tax returns have to be filed. And yes, an SFR counts as a tax return. Don't forget that. Uh, for businesses, they must be compliant with federal tax deposit requirements. You're not going to get an installment agreement, let alone pending status, if the business is still accruing additional payroll tax liabilities. Uh, what I always tell clients is from, from day one, is we have to pick a point in time where you start paying your taxes that you're supposed to be anyway. There has to be, uh, you know, a 15th of, of some month where you start making federal tax deposits and you never miss them again. Best thing to do here, in my opinion, is for every business that you work with, get them onto a payroll service, okay? That, that's the easiest way to make this happen. Um, for your... Um, uh, for your, your self-employed folks that are not making their estimated tax payments, um, get them onto a payroll service as well. Uh, do an S-Corp or, or whatever if you have to, but get them onto a paycheck the, the, uh, so that they don't have to deal with this particular problem. Okay, So all these things have to be in place in order to make a valid installment agreement request. So this is the nitty-gritty detail about uh, the, the partial pay installment agreement. Uh, there is no cap on the dollar amount of a partial pay installment agreement. Okay? Your taxpayer could owe $200 million, and they can get a partial pay installment agreement. Okay? Um, uh, any tax type is eligible, including payroll taxes, including excise taxes, including trust fund recovery penalties, okay? Uh, there is no exclusion to the PPIA for tax type or dollar amount, period. Uh, time limit usually runs up until the CSED, the collection statute expiration date, uh, but an extension in limited circumstances may be required, and we'll talk about that here in a moment. Uh, the, on the financial side, this is full rubber glove treatment, okay? Um, so, um, and also point out uh, that there is a 24-month requirement by law, okay? This is not IRM, this is law. There is a financial review required. And Tony, yes, I see your comment. You haven't seen the mask for updated financials in 20 years. Uh, TIGTA just did a study on this, and I'll talk about that here in a minute. Uh, basically, the IRS isn't following the law. A uh, big, big surprise, right? Uh, a tax lien will be filed. 
and if your client has assets that can be disposed of in order to put some money towards the government, they're going to require it. Now, TIGTA also found that this wasn't always necessarily being complied with, but under the law, asset disposition is required. Uh, a manager must sign off on a partial pay installment agreement. And yes, TIGTA did found, find that this wasn't always happening, but technically it's required. Uh, for a business, uh, absolutely positively guaranteed if there is a trust fund uh, uh, amount at stake, the trust fund recovery penalty will be assessed against somebody. Uh, you are not going to get a partial pay installment agreement for a business on payroll taxes without the trust fund recovery penalty being assessed. Ain't going to happen. Uh, if the taxpayer has previously had an installment agreement within the past two years and they defaulted on it and now you're entering into a PPIA, the IRS is going to require a direct debit. Okay. Uh, and then I always, 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 always encourage you run RCP calculations for every client no matter what. Always calculate reasonable collection potential under the offer and compromise formula. Always. Even if it's a back of the envelope calculation. Okay. This is even easier if you're using a practice management software like Canopy or Pitbull. They will do the calculation for you. Okay. There's really no excuse for not ever uh, doing this. Um, and, and once you do it five or six times, you'll be able to do it in about 30 seconds on the back of a napkin, okay, uh, to do a rough RCP calculation. It's, base, it's basically assets times 0.8 plus remaining income um, uh, uh, times 12 or 24, right? You add those together. If that's less than the amount of the tax liability, they might be eligible for an offer and compromise, okay? Um, but yeah, consider the offer and compromise and the pros and cons of doing an offer and compromise uh, if your client is looking at a PPIA situation. Uh, let me get to some questions. Uh, what extends the CSED? Uh, Tony, there's a lot of things that extend the CSED uh, beyond the scope of, of the hour we have today. Uh, but if you apply for a CDP appeal, if you apply for an offer and compromise, things like that are the most common things that extend the CSED day for day during those actions. Um, uh, Eric, yes, you can request a modification to an IA. Um, uh, Lucinda, if a valid extension is in place for the current tax year, are they considered current on their filing requirements? Yes. Uh, Tony, never seen the mass for updated financials, correct. Um, that is a failure on the IRS's part. Um, uh, why a, uh, Anthony asked, why a partial pay versus a regular IA? Uh, Anthony, it's because if you're going to get an installment agreement, but it's not going to full pay the tax debt within the 10-year statute of limitations, then it's by definition a partial pay. Uh, what do you do if the IRS has not assessed the trust fund? I need to get it assessed before I put in OIC. Um, Talk to the revenue officer, say, hey, let's do the 4180, or just send me a, an 1153. Uh, we'll, we'll sign the 2750 and, and march forward, or the 2751, we'll march forward with life. Um, just, just push on the assessment. Okay. Uh, next polling question. And again, uh, enrolled agents, you must answer the polling questions as well. Uh, I know the CPAs in the crowd are used to doing this, but EAs, you must do so also. And I'll leave this up for 60 seconds. What do you call a boomerang that doesn't come back? Can you tell I went through a stupid joke book? Yes, you can. Nobody thinks it was the eight-second aerial adventure? Come on. <laughs> uh, 
I'm trying to make CPE more fun, because we all know that this stuff isn't fun. Ten seconds remaining. Get your answers, boys and girls. Five, four, three, two. Ding, 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 ding. And for the curious, what do you call a boomerang that doesn't come back? A stick. Ha <laughs> ha. So funny I forgot to laugh. All right, let's talk about this full financial investigation. Uh, a full financial investigation requires a full and complete Form 433A or B. When you're doing a... Um, a uh, uh, Anthony, if the payment period extends beyond the CSED, it's still a PPIA. Yes, because only a PPIA can go beyond the CSED. Other installment agreement types cannot go beyond the CSED. If you're on an installment agreement and the CSED day rolls around, you stop paying on the installment agreement and they don't owe the rest of the tax. It all just goes away. That's why it's called a partial pay installment agreement. Okay. Uh, full and complete 433A or B, uh, you will be doing PPIAs with people that are above the main line ACS personnel. You'll never do a PPIA with ACS main line personnel, okay, the people you call on the phone, the 829-1040 people. Those aren't the folks that are dealing with a, a PPIA, okay. You'll be working with appeals, a revenue officer. Um, a supervisor in a large case unit, you'll be dealing with somebody that is not on the ACS call floor, okay? So, uh, therefore, you will not be using a 433F. You'll be using a 433A for an individual or self-employed person, or 433B for a business. Uh, the income that you report on a, uh, Renee, I already went over this, uh, to apply for a PPIA, it's, it's, it's no different than applying for any other installment agreement. Use the 9465 if you want to. Send an email, a fax, a voicemail, whatever. That's how you get the ball rolling. Uh, the income that is reported on the 433A or B will be compared to IMF and BMF wage data. Okay, so the IRS will check their computer systems. They're going to look for 1099s, they're, uh, including 1099Ks. Um, they're going to be verifying the information reported on income. If you are reporting on a 433 a decrease of 20% or more in a personal or business income, as reported on a return or indicated on, on wage and income data, you're going to have to explain it. So, for example, if a, uh, I used to be a uh, long time ago before I got into tax, I was a real estate investor and broker. Um, I went bankrupt in the, uh, the, the, in 2008 in the financial crash. Um, so, I was no longer a real estate agent. I was no longer selling houses. My income dropped way more than 20%. It dropped more like 98%. Um, and so if I had been in a tax debt situation, I would have had to explain that. Um, and it's a, it's a very simple explanation, um, you know, due to economic factors, blah, blah, blah. Um, this is why my income went down, okay? Um, for large debts, so if a taxpayer owes a particularly large debt um, or if a taxpayer has any significant equity in assets, the IRS is going to verify all the assets and look for more. The IRS has paid subscriptions to commercial databases. Okay? So they have access to Experian business credit reports. They have access to Dun & Bradstreet. Um, they have access to everything under the sun in terms of UCC filings. Okay, um, they're going to pull credit reports, and they don't have to ask your permission. 
Um, so the IRS is going to check county records. They're looking for real estate. They're going to look. They're going to look for UCC ones that um, are are uh, securing financing on equipment. Um, they're going to pull DMV records from your state. Okay. They're going to verify assets, and under a full financial investigation, the IRS goes in with the attitude that you are a liar. Okay, they assume that your client is trying to hide assets and money. That is the attitude that they're going into this financial investigation with. Okay, so they are looking for stuff. Also understand that under a partial pay installment agreement, conditional expenses will not be allowed. Those of you that are used to living in the world of streamlined installment agreements or regular installment agreements that are still subject to the six-year rule and you're used to getting some of those conditional expenses beyond the uh, collection financial standards, you're going to hit a brick wall if you do a PPIA because those conditional expenses will not be allowed. Um, where possible, the taxpayer will be expected to try to cash out any equity in assets that they own. And if the taxpayer doesn't make a good faith effort to do this, the PPIA will simply be denied, uh, and then there's the potential for seizure action on the asset. Uh, biggest thing here is, you know, if the taxpayer, let's say they own a half a million dollar yacht, free and clear, they better either try to sell it or get a loan against it, you know, do a cash out loan against it so that they can put the, the, the equity in that boat against the tax debt. If they fail to do this, the IRS is just going to take it. Okay. Uh, and by the way, if you're ever looking for a good deal on an airplane or there's a helicopter for sale down in uh, California right now, uh, some fast cars uh, out here in Washington, they just sold a, a stable of uh, pony cars. Um, uh, you know, cl uh, collectible uh, muscle cars. You can get some great things at IRS auctions, okay? And this is where they get them. So uh, I always say loan denial letters are your friend. Uh, most of the time, people, uh, their, their credit is destroyed by the tax lien, and so no one's going to lend them any money, right? Um, so I always try to go in and get at least three loan denial letters uh, on anything that has significant equity. Now let's talk about those nasty CSED extensions, okay? Now again, remember, the whole point of a partial pay installment agreement is that the IRS is never going to collect the full amount of the tax liability. They're never going to get fully paid. That's why it's called a partial pay. On an installment agreement, the IRS can only take your money up until the date that the 10-year statute of limitations expires, okay? Once that date comes and goes, the installment agreement is dead and the tax debt is null and void, okay? So it is occasionally a resolution strategy to put a client into non-collectible status and just ride out the 10 years, okay? and then the debt goes away, and then they go on with their life. Okay, perfectly legitimate resolution strategy. Well, if your client is not eligible for CNC, non-collectible status, and they're going to be on a payment plan, but the payment plan won't full pay the liability before the 10 years is up, then this is installment agreement territory. Okay, so I just want to make that very clear. Um, however, even on a partial pay installment agreement, the IRS cannot continue to collect the installment agreement payments unless there is a waiver of the 10 years and there is a legitimate reason for the service to continue getting paid. The circumstance under which a extension of the 10 years is allowed is only in a situation where the taxpayer has a reasonable 
expectation of coming into money at a future date after the 10 years. Okay. So for example, the example here, uh, if a business is working on a real estate development, uh, they're pouring money into the development project, there's operating expenses into it, and the development isn't worth anything right now. It's just dirt and, and lumber and concrete blocks. Okay. But after the dirt, lumber, and concrete blocks are assembled into a shopping center and the shopping center is sold to a management company, then that asset is suddenly worth something. Well, in that case, if the project is already in progress, when the installment agreement is set up, the IRS will insist that the CSED be extended out to the point where that project is going to be worth something and is sold, the taxpayer is going to collect money that they can again then give to the IRS, okay? Uh, or uh, on, a, on a personal income tax side, let's say that a, a taxpayer is the beneficiary of an estate uh, and things are locked up in, in the probate process um, and the CSED is going to expire in two months. Well, the IRS can secure an installment agreement, a PPIA right now, knowing that the taxpayer is going to come into money whenever probate is settled and expect some additional cash out. Okay. Um, the extension of the 10-year period is not required when the only purpose of the extension would be to continue making the installment agreement payments. Okay, if there is no future expectation of coming into money, then the CSED is not extended. Also, the CSED extension can only be secured when the installment agreement is set up. So if you set up an installment agreement for a taxpayer now, and let's say the CSED is five years, and they're, that you set up the installment agreement now, and half, and, and two, three years down the road, they uh, something happens, and there's this expectation that arises that they're going to come into an asset with value, an inheritance, something like that. And if that would be after the five years left in the CSED, the IRS can't tack it on. Okay. So the waiver, the extension of the CSED, has to be from the get-go. The, the expectation of coming into money has to be identified when the installment agreement is set up. Uh, ho hopefully that's, that's, that's clear. Um, the CSED cannot be extended as a result of the two-year financial review. Okay? So at the time of the 24-month financial review, a CSED extension cannot be set up. However, if the taxpayer blows up the installment agreement, they default, and then they set up a new installment agreement afterwards, then all bets are off, okay? There is a time limit, okay? There is a time limit, uh, and that time limit is five years. So the 10-year collection statute becomes, at a maximum, 15 years but in reality it's actually 16 years because there's this weird administrative action rule okay so because of various administrative actions the IRS can tack on up to an additional year making it 16 years uh, the form 900 that is the form for extent that's the waiver of the CSED um, all tax types and periods have to be included on the form uh, and the taxpayer does not need to sign the, the extension. Okay, it is optional. However, not signing will result in rejection. Uh, group managers are required to, and again this is by law, uh, their group managers are required to ensure that a financial analysis was done, uh, that other collection alternatives were considered, 
uh, the, the IRS does not like PPIAs. They would even prefer an OIC over a PPIA because an OIC has finality to it. Okay? Um, uh, they must also document the rationale for allowing a taxpayer to retain any assets with equity. So, for example, if a taxpayer has, say, you know, uh, 10, 20, 30, 40 thousand dollars of equity in their home, they're unable to do a cash out refi to put any of that money towards the the uh, uh, tax debt because of the tax lien and their credit is now shot. Then that's the rationale for retention of the asset. Um, the IRS cannot force you to sell your primary residence. Um, and also they have to document that the PPIA will not create an economic hardship for the taxpayer. Uh, and again, uh, we're, we're kind of at time here. Uh, we do have one more polling question, so I'm going to rush through this here real quick. Um, the taxpayer has to be current with, with uh, uh, filing requirements and compliant with federal tax deposit or estimated tax payment obligations. Uh, you can send a letter or use a 9465. I prefer a letter, mail it, fax it, leave a voicemail for the RO, whatever you got to do. Uh, be sure to include all tax types and periods. Do not screw this up. Um, if you do, it's an E&O claim waiting to happen. Uh, be ready for that full investigation, okay? Um, the, the taxpayer is not going to like it, but if they want the PPIA, they're going to have to suck it up and deal with it. Um, and make sure you deal with the trust fund recovery penalty. That has to be addressed. I mentioned earlier this TIGTA report. Um, uh, basically, it found that the, the IRS failed in meeting many of the required things that they're supposed to do. Um, the two-year review, uh, the manual review that's required in certain cases, they failed to do it in over half of the sample uh, that TIGTA reviewed. 15% um, of PPIAs were established without uh, the rubber glove treatment, um, and over a third of, IA, of PPIAs that were sampled didn't have managerial approval. Now, obviously, that's actually a good thing for us, right? Um, this actually makes things easier for us and our clients. Uh, TIGTA also made a recommendation that the IRS offer uh, a PPIA to uh, to about 8% of all the active CNC cases uh, to try to collect some money, uh, and the IRS denied uh, the implementation phase of that recommendation simply due to their own budget constraints and lack of resources. And again, that's also good for us that have clients in CNC. Uh, helpful tips. When you're, this is uh, uh, particularly on, on the 433. Uh, make sure you maximize expenses. Make sure you claim everything that you're legally allowed to, just like uh, deductions. Uh, minimize income. Um, I encourage you to get the bank loan denial process going in advance. Um, uh, for trust fund uh, payroll tax situations, use the form 2750 uh, uh, as a bargaining chip. Um, and again, uh, sorry, way beyond the scope of this presentation. I just don't have time to go into it. Um, that's an, an hour to itself. Uh, make sure you take care of all tax accounts at the same time. Um, and make sure, and this has to do with the CSET extension, make sure to ask your client about contracts, trusts, um, estates, um, you know, any potential that they have for coming into money in the future because the IRS is going to uncover that, okay? Uh, so in conclusion, uh, make sure that you run the numbers. Always, always, always calculate reasonable collection potential using the offer and compromise formula to determine if the offer and compromise might be a better option for your client. Uh, make sure you take care of the loan denial process uh, and make sure your client is current and compliant with filing and payment obligations in order to even get this ball rolling. So uh, obviously, uh, to learn more, Internal Revenue Manual Part 5, uh, if, if you are doing collections representation work, um, IRM Part 5 is your Bible, okay? Um, so, uh, and then I also have additional courses on this topic on prolera.com. Uh, Anthony, can the IRS go after your retirement funds? 
Yes, yes they can. Uh, so last polling question. <laughs> this is the stupidest joke of them all. Why is six so afraid of seven? <laughs> So to get your CPE credit, make sure you answer the stupid joke. I'll leave this up for one minute. Uh, and again, in order to receive CPE credit, you must have stayed on for the full time, answer all three polling questions. Um, and if you did those things, you will send your certificate of completion within the next 72 hours. Uh, for those of you that are enrolled agents, uh, hours will not be reported to the IRS probably until early October uh, because the IRS is taking the reporting system offline because they are transitioning to a new vendor for that program uh, during the next fiscal year. Uh, can they go after Social Security benefits? Yes, IRS can levy Social Security benefits up to 15%. All right, we're closing out the polling question. And why is six so afraid of seven? Because seven, eight, nine. Get it? Seven, eight, number eight, consume, gobble, gobble, nine. Yeah, stupid joke. If you have a six-year-old, they'll find it funny. With that... This has been Jason Bowman from Prolera.com. Um, oh, if you are an EA, make sure that your PTIN is in your Prolera profile. I always forget to mention that. Uh, make sure that your PTIN is in your Prolera profile if you are an enrolled agent. If your PTIN is not in there, I can't report your hours to the IRS. And double check it. Make sure it's spelled right. Your, your name is spelled right and correct number, all that fun stuff. All right. Thanks for being online with us today. And I hope that you have a wonderful, wonderful uh, extension season. Take care. Bye-bye.